Okay, let's get started. Dream hoarding. Scott, are you a dream hoarder? I think that the author makes a really compelling case that um, it's a real issue that we need to deal with, and I very much appreciated the dimensions that you identified. But I think that CUNY, the institution where I work, um, is actively working against dream hoarding, that 40% of our students have family incomes of 20000 or less. A study came out last year that um, showed that CUNY had grad put, propelled six times more people into the middle class than the Ivy League, Duke, and Stanford put together. So wow. I think especially if we focus... Yeah. Especially if we focus on the open access community colleges committed to low income, first generation, diverse students, that, that I agree with you that the community colleges are the jewel of our system. But you know, Scott, I know you're not satisfied. Now, you run an institution that is sort of built from completion from the ground up. You were the first president, and you got to go in with a clean slate and think about all the right ways to do it. But you know, we're really excited about the work we're going to be doing with CUNY soon. So I, knew, I know there's a hunger within CUNY to do even more. So what, as you think about addressing upper mobility and in, improving graduation rates, what do you think CUNY needs to be focused on next? On pathways, I think to work more um, with K through, K through 12 to find a lot more effective ways to get students to finish community colleges and then get an incentive to go to senior colleges because nearly all our students want to get baccalaureate degrees and I don't think we do a remarkably good job of helping them make that transition and, and then to go on to graduate education. I thought your argument that graduate education is now um, very important. I, I ran into one of our students um, from our first class the other day. We started five years ago and he's He's finishing his master's degree at Brooklyn College. That's in a total of five years from starting associate degree. And I think wow. we need to find out how to do that uh, with more students. And I also think we need to do a lot more work with employers. That mm -hmm. um, CUNY overall is trying to do that. Um, that our students come to um, CUNY because they want to get jobs. And, Ten years from now, I think the thing that's going to get the most notoriety from our college is a course that we started called Ethnographies of Work, mm -hmm. that every student in his first or her first year goes out and does an ethnography of a career in which they might have interest. It gives them a methodology, and it, I think that interest in a career propels them in, to be more successful academically. Yeah. yeah, that's great. That's great. Helen, I'm going to turn to you next, if you don't mind. You know, you became famous in our world as uh, one of our favorite legislators. Uh, you stood up and challenged Texas to uh, review its data on remediation and move legislation to change it all. What was the inspiration behind all that, and how does that relate to your concept of the American dream for the constituents that you serve? Well, basically, I started to look at and to study why our average student debt load was so high and what we could do to change that. Of course, I found some of the things that uh, one would expect to find, that in many cases, students were trying uh, an average of 159 hours to get yeah. a 120 oh hour yeah. degree. Obviously, uh, mm -hmm. that drives the cost up. But additionally, when I looked further, I found that uh, in terms of developmental education, uh, we are doing a very, very poor job in Texas, an average of about 13 to 14 percent of the people who attempt um, developmental ed actually go on uh, to, to earn uh, college credits, particularly in math. Yeah. And so uh, we're failing there. Yeah. And so uh, we uh, started to work with uh, Complete uh, College, and uh, we overhaul developmental ed so that we're doing the co-requisite model now and it's too early to know what's going to happen yeah. but I think it could only um, it, we can only improve but but I do want to say in terms of this whole conversation obviously this is complete college America but but this story starts so much earlier than today this this story starts at pre-k. Mm -hmm. uh, this story starts in my state 
uh, with uh, teachers telling me for elementary school that when I get the kids in first grade, they're this far behind other kids. And then I get uh, colleges telling me when I get the kids from uh, high school, uh, they're already behind, they're not prepared, and so the blame game uh -huh. uh, continues to go uh -huh. around. And I think it's important for us, all of us, to do better. But I think for us to end up where we want to be uh -huh. in terms of college, uh -huh. we've got to make changes at the pre-K level uh -huh. when so much learning uh, takes place, yeah. because I believe that uh, talent and, and uh, that kind of thing is, is spread equally. Mm -hmm. uh, I, the opportunities yeah. are not equal. Some kids yeah. don't have the opportunity to travel yeah. and, yeah. and uh, improve their vocabularies yeah. and that kind of thing yeah. uh, before they get to school. And some yeah. kids uh, do. And it makes a real difference. Yeah, but Richard, isn't the big game changer, and that's all true, Helen, well put, but isn't the game, big game changer getting them through college? Mm -hmm. Because when you get through college, you change the entire narrative of your family, you know, and you're more likely to be able to afford excellent pre-K and all that. I'm not taking anything away from what you said, Helen, but, but if we don't get more through, then we don't build this, this cadre of families that, that have the stability and strength to be able to, to change the, the narrative of their families. Would you agree, Richard? I would, and I, I appreciate what Helen said. It's, uh, I think we're in the same place on this, which is understand from a public policy point of view, of course, we need to be doing all of that. But where do I stand now? Where do I sit? What institutional power do I have right now? Um, and the danger is that it's, we, we end up, you phrase the blame game is right. You end up saying, well, what can I do? Um, and it is harder because of the inequalities that we inherit. But right now, George, uh, Anthony Carnevale rather said this, that the U.S. college system takes the inequalities given to it and amplifies them. Mm. And as a whole, that's true. It may not be true of some of the institutions that we're talking about right now, but as a whole, it doesn't make things better. It makes them worse. And so at the very least, the college system shouldn't be making things worse. But I do say one other thing that, um, I mean, obviously Scott's from CUNY and the ASAP program, yeah. which is like mentoring people through yeah. and bridging is the from enrollment to completion thing. Yeah. It's this kind of first year dropout, where I think CUNY, I think that's where a lot of the investment needs to go, and it's expensive in some cases, or it's intensive, I should say. Yeah. But the other thing, the point you've just made is simplicity. What is this, 100, you said 159 hours to, to complete? Mm. You said time is the enemy of completion. Amen. And it seems to me this is entirely the wrong way around. If you go to an elite, you, uh, elite institution, you're very strongly guided along certain pathways. You're very unlikely to waste time or take the wrong credits. Or whatever. You do this, you major in this, you minor that. If you're going to a less well-funded institution, it's more likely to be here are all these thousands of things you could do, and then you realize later you've done the wrong thing. So you don't have guide. So this work on guided pathways and so on, I think. Right. Because complexity is the friend of the upper middle class. Those of us who are in the know, we can navigate complexity. Yeah. And so if we do nothing else, simplify admissions, simplify progress, mm -hmm. simplify credits, mm -hmm. simplify, right. simplify, simplify, simplify. Mm -hmm. Because I think many of us forget that actually complexity is fine for a lot of us, right. but yeah. it kills the uh, completion yeah. of a lot of yeah. kids. Well, and we've recognized right. that in the state of Texas when we started this conversation about co-requisites and that kind of thing. Uh, many of our colleges and universities uh, have now, for the first time this session, hired a number of pathway counselors so that when students get in, uh, they do not lose their way mm. and uh, rack up all these mm -hmm. hours mm -hmm. and this expense well, uh, unnecessarily. We're big believers in pathways, obviously, and um, you'll hear more, ladies and gentlemen, tomorrow from our senior vice president, Bruce Vandal, about where we're taking pathways now and, and what we've learned on how best to implement them. I want to turn back for a moment to this issue of amplifying inequity, uh, which is frightening. Uh, but Teresa, you know, you've really owned the closure of achievement gaps. Uh, and I think that's an incredibly important uh, uh, example of your leadership, especially, quite honestly, in my home state, a red state of Indiana. Not always an inter uh, easy conversation to have around equity, uh, but I think you came to the conclusion that you just weren't going to get there uh, without being more serious about closing those gaps. Tell us about your challenge to your state and, and what happened as a result. 
Well, like many in the audience, we're in the process of changing a culture of a state where education beyond high school was actually not important to live the middle class life until uh, recent decades. And so as a part of that, we set, like many of you have, the attainment goal, and we knew that we could not reach our goal without uh, closing the achievement gap as well. And I think this is where policies and statutes can actually be on your side if done correctly. We said we were going to close the achievement gap by 2025, which was the same year that we were setting our 60% goal, and cut it in half by 2018. We're about halfway there to close the achievement gap. The next part is going to be really hard, but it sent the right message. One that was not universally loved because people said it's impossible to do that, mm -hmm. to which we replied to not accept that as the goal would be to accept an achievement gap, and we won't do that. Another example of policies, you know, the, in keeping with what you're saying, we passed a policy that said, you know, our degrees and programs would meet the 120 or the 60 credit standard unless there was a compelling reason for it not to based on student benefit. And we've reversed 90% of the degrees exceeding that to 90% of them meeting that goal, saving Hoosier students, you know, $50,000 a year in, in extra costs. Mm. But I'd like to, for just a moment, yeah, visit... The, the topic itself of dream hoarding and why I think this is a difficult topic for many people because it does um, infer intentionality. Mm -hmm. And that's difficult to hear, especially for someone like me. Mm -hmm. I, I am first generation. I'm one of those people who stood up. Both of my parents came from poverty and infused in us a sense that education would be something that was the expectation. Mm -hmm. And um, so the idea of that hoarding, I think, is a really uncomfortable, though compelling, topic for us to be discussing. You know, the, at the lower uh, range of what you're talking about with income for that upper middle class, it could be a family of two teachers working and they fit into that category. Mm -hmm. um, so I think the question of how we approach that topic is really important, and I, I don't want to lose this opportunity to say one other thing in case I lose the chance later. I looked back at a commencement address that was given by Mitch Daniels, who was our former governor, and he's currently the president of Purdue, and he called out the graduates of Purdue in this way. He said, you know, starting today, life will invite you to separate professionally, socially, residentially, and attitudinally from those who don't have your educational equipment. Please don't. Hmm. Universities like ours were created specifically to build a broader middle class and a more inclusive, unified society. So hmm. I offer that in the spirit of hope hmm. that many of us who are out there working in this area realize the challenge but are committed to the big goal of closing yeah. the achievement gap. Yeah, well, well put. Hmm. Um, well, if I could... If yes, I could. please go ahead. If I could piggyback on that, I, I think a part of the problem, as I see it, um, is that there are these uh, structural hurdles and that there are these false assumptions. And I'll briefly speak about a program that I put in place at the University of Texas at Dallas. The University of Texas at Dallas has the highest entering uh, scores of any state institution that we have. So we went out and we found students who didn't score very well, mm -hmm. who were largely low income. Mm -hmm. We took those students and we put them in the setting with the highest scoring students in the system, uh -huh. the cream of the crop. Uh -huh. And you should go to the website and see. The kids on the academic bridge program graduate sooner, more likely to graduate, mm -hmm. graduate with high G higher GPAs, and they're graduating in STEM fields. These are electrical they engineers work. and Absolutely. that kind of thing. Absolutely. So it's, right. it's based on false assumptions you that if your score is this, yep. you're not going to be able to perform. Yep. Did it, it, can I ask, did it have any effect on the scores of the high achieving students that you put them with? Did it, did it bring down the scores of the ones that you put them with? Well, that's a question that I'd never thought of. I don't think it did, but what I can tell you is that those students ended up. I, I mean, my, my, my assumption is not, because yeah. that would be what the evidence is, but it, but it would be what, I hope this is okay, but that's what people's fear would be about their high school, their institution, which is, look, I don't want too many poor kids uh, and uh, low achieving kids near my kids, because my kids will suffer. Uh, and I don't want to put them into an institution where there's lots of poor kids because my kids won't do as well. And so all the evidence we have that suggests that's not true yeah. and that that okay. isn't an actual trade-off exactly. is very important. Yeah. Yeah. If, if ben, you, you want to pick that up, go ahead. Because I, there's one of the institutions back there that's with us from California, 
And they actually, they actually did a very similar thing. They took a whole cohort of young people using multiple measures. They placed them, uh, they placed them and they had two, literally two cohorts, kind of like a blind sort of a thing. And uh, actually the multiple measured kids didn't want it on the course, didn't anything, actually scored a tiny bit better there you go. than the regular cohort. Yeah. Yeah. And so as a result, so what we're uh, they had, you know, they got a, a little bit extra help and that sort of thing. So, so they were never watered down. No, mm -hmm. you know, that's one of the, that's one right. of the concerns yes. from faculty and I, and I, before, and I do want to say, okay. one of the really key, key groups for us as educators is our faculty, is to literally get our faculty on that's board. Right. That's and we right. can't let, I mean, there are wonderful faculty members here who are here because they're believers. There are wonderful faculty members who are home because they're believers and they're wonderful. Yeah. But we also have detractors in the faculty ranks who are oftentimes the barrier yeah. to making some things happen for yeah. us. Mm -hmm. And um, with respect to the, to the correct legislation that, that, that uh, happened in Texas, and that was wonderful, we actually heard, uh, we had a CCA uh, a rep to one of our summits, and one of our assemblymen who was there saw the data, he's, a, he's a, an ER doc by trade, right? So he sees this data, uh -huh. and it's so compelling uh -huh. that he literally called us up and he said, I, I want to write a piece of legislation. We're actually working in California, hoping to do a very similar sort of a thing. Okay. And of course, the other thing that happened in California, which, we're, which I thought was just so gutsy, was the Executive Order 1110 from the California State University system. Where the, where the chancellor says there will, we will use multiple measures mm -hmm. for placing students. They're, they're not, you're not gonna be placing anyone in a class that isn't credit bearing yep. unless yep. you have some really compelling reasons. Yep. And then they're also in, in, uh, implementing co-requisite remediation yep. uh, and, and literally going through that transformation now. They're having some growing pains. I mean, they're having some tough times. They're having some tough times with their faculty but it's a leap. It's yeah. a mega, mega it's leap. And I'm so, I'm so happy yeah. for that. Well, the world is changing, Ben. I mean, it's really coming our way now, and people's eyes are opening. I gotta put you on the spot, though, a little bit. I hope you don't mind. When you talked about the faculty and how important they are and, and how committed they must be to student success, are there any incentives for them to be that you know, kind that, of faculty? That's a, that's a really good, that's a, mm. that's a really good uh, point, because I do think that uh, California right now is like wallowing in riches for some weird reason. <laughs> yeah. You know, the, it's a the gold rush. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the, the, the third gold rush. So, so California has received like $150 million for the implementation of guided pathways. So all colleges, all community colleges in the state can get the dough if they, if they do certain things, right? So in the CVHEC, we are, we're pursuing that path. There also, there's also money for the California promise. There's money. So what a couple of things are happening, I, we talked a little bit about it in the back, is that, and we need to be really careful, literally around, across the country, where our faculty are going like, enough is enough. I mean, we can only drink out of so much of this big of a pipe because they're dying from uh, initiative overload. Yeah. Someone comes up with this good idea, that good yeah. idea, that good idea. So yeah. what we're trying to do is, not only through the Central Valley Higher Ed Consortium, but in other, other parts of the state, we're really trying to kind of take all of these things that are out there and say, no, no, you know what? When we talk about guided pathways, yeah. you know, that is the umbrella and we're gonna help you yeah. stick them in there. So the incentives to the faculty yeah. then yeah. come in professional learning opportunities yeah. and the ability to give them uh, uh, enough time to do their work. That's where the CSU might be having mm -hmm. an, an issue mm -hmm. right now because they're compressing their yeah. time for them to do yeah. it. We're suggesting to, to the faculty and to the leaders yeah. and to, to the deans and the vice yeah. presidents and the presidents, yeah. look, this is gonna take a while. Yeah. And we didn't get here overnight, yeah. so it's gonna take us yeah. a while to literally transform. But, but in it, the incentives have to include, you know, the faculty, the opportunities to, to get involved, and not only to get involved uh, in professional learning, but to call upon their expertise yeah. and let them design yeah. these things because yeah. they are if, you're given yeah. the, if they're given the chance, they are the experts yeah. in the, well, I agree. the design. You know, you heard me in my speech talk about how Alan uh, had no incentive whatsoever, it didn't make tenure more likely for him or anything, uh, to be an excellent educator. Uh, but Scott, I want you to respond to that a little bit. You built a culture at Gutman uh, that's very faculty focused. I had this remarkable experience with your faculty after a graduation ceremony there. And they are owning their data, and they are continually challenging themselves to improve. How did that happen? 
Why, 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 I'm so excited about it. How do we replicate that? I think when faculty come um, to campus, they have to do their work differently. And one of the ways is to have learning communities, you know, oftentimes called schedule blocks, so that faculty get a chance to work together focused on particular students. At our college, the students um, all come to a bridge program and then they're taught by an instructional team and the instructional team gets an hour and a half course credit per week to get together to design signature assignments and to figure out how to, to implement mm -hmm. the college on an ongoing basis. Mm -hmm. And the faculty tell me that's by far the most uh, profound professional mm -hmm. development they've mm -hmm. ever had mm -hmm. because they're learning um, mm -hmm. from one another and then that has unintended mm -hmm. consequences like interdisciplinary presentations and, and papers. So th the day of the solo faculty member being sent off into a lecture hall and said, do your thing. I, I can remember as a beginning faculty member, if somebody opened the door, my mouth went closed. It's like, <laughs> this is my little kingdom, and if you can't be here when I'm here, and, and the whole system reinforced that. And I think, you know, it's a long time ago now, but Boyer talked about how yeah. teaching has to be public activity and to have the faculty work together and learn from one another. And, and I think yeah. we've been able to structure a college that that happens. Yeah. Well, it's my hope, you know, that trying to present this in a different context, you know, a, uh, a greater shared sense of purpose, uh, for people to understand that it isn't just about their classroom. It's about the contribution they're make, making to sustain what we most love about uh, what America was supposed to represent and is starting to to lose over time. And I think, you know, Ben, I hear this initiative fatigue stuff all the time. Uh, and I know, you know, it's real if you think about all this in components. The places where we've broken through on this initial fatigue is when we challenge people to think about this as a larger vision. There are elements and, and, and steps to take to accomplish this larger vision. So it looks like it's a, it's a big elephant to take one bite out of, but, but there is a process, and we'll go more deeply in that tomorrow. But I do want to return back to the stream hoarding uh, issue, uh, Richard, because I agree. I, I love being provocative, in case you can't tell. Um, and I thought your title was uh, brilliant uh, because it did challenge us. And, and I guess what I hoped by bringing you here today would happen is uh, I, I'm not trying to convince anybody here to give up their, their 529s or their, their home mortgage interest deductions. I want to keep mine too. Um, but what I'm trying to convince you all is that largely you are of the upper middle class. Most of you have achieved or are achieving your American dream. Uh, and so keep your home mortgage interest deduction. But when you, you have those hands on the levers of power, pull them for students. Pull them for students. There are things you can do. There are things you can do to be a part of this larger narrative. And so that's how I process it, Teresa. And, but, but you know, she said, hey, yeah, dream hoarding, you're making her feel a little guilty over there, Richard. What's yeah. your response to that? Well, uh, You must get this all the time, uh, I'm yeah. sure. Uh, and you're right. I don't think my mission was come here and piss everyone off. <laughs> that's, uh, that's my mission. Yeah, that's right. yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah great speech. Um, so, and I was just, I'm going to comment on the incentive point a little bit, if I may, too. But please, on the central yes, point, which is yeah. what's the, what is the purpose of pointing at upper middle class folk who are currently doing very well in the system? They are the only ones who've seen above average income growth. They are predominantly the ones who are sending their kids to the highest quality institutions. They do benefit from upside down tax subsidies. They are increasingly separated. I love that quote. And in fact, I'd love to see that mm -hmm. speech. The incentives, that they're increasingly geographically separated yeah. and occupationally separated. And so yes, it was partly a deliberate attempt to poke that sure. group and say, just pause for a moment and ask yourself whether everything you're doing passes the test of fairness which you would want to apply to a society more generally. And if you are doing things which contribute to the very inequality yep. which you claim to yep. be against, and just yep. pause. So E.J. Dion is a good colleague yep. of mine, a quote yep. in the book. He said, I spend my days railing against inequality and my evenings and weekends adding to it. <laughs> we all do that a bit. Yep. But, and I, I, I start with standing in your own shoes. I love your target, but I'm trying to try and provoke a conversation which is to say sometimes it will require us perhaps to give up something. Yes. We might actually have to pay a bit more. Yes. I claim my uh, 529 deduction and then give exactly the dollar value of it to me, to a, to a non-profit in DC to, oh. that promotes college going. Yeah. 
Um, and so I take it, because it's good to save for it, but then I give it away. I'm trying to get my school PTA to give half their money away. Um, we're trying, we're, Brookings yeah. has overturned their intern internship yeah. program. So, yeah. so starting from where we are sound, can always sounds trivial, but actually I think we need to just accept the fact that if we want if we want more mixed neighborhoods, more mixed schools, more opportunity, then that might require a little bit of sacrifice yeah. on our yeah. part. Now, it's an incredibly unpopular thing yeah. to say. Yeah, the yeah. popular thing to say is, no, 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 this is win-win. I'm appealing to your enlightened self-interest. Yeah. But the fact is, simply sticking the word enlightened in front of self-interest doesn't change the fact that I'm still appealing to your self-interest. Yeah. My own view is that self-interest will only take us so far. Yeah. And that we need a different kind of conversation about that. And that's what I'm trying to provoke. It's uncomfortable, I agree. but. 529 plans are the most regressive part of the tax code, and they should go. Simple. Let me, let me <laughs> offer a counter to that a little bit, which is if you look at a state like Indiana, which has made a huge commitment to need-based financial aid, which you really don't talk about in that, which we distribute almost $350 million for need-based financial aid. Um, yeah, we rank actually first in the Midwest and fifth in the nation. And so what you have from a political standpoint for those who have served politically is we uh, have continued, the legislature, in good times and bad, have continued to put more money into financial aid to make it possible for students, to, to, for us to say to them, if you work hard in school, you will be able to go to college. And not just at any college, we make it possible for you to make a choice, public, private. The best fit for you is what that financial aid allows them to do. I don't think that you can separate that from the discussion of 529 plans, because what we will hear from, from middle income families is, we don't get any of that. Mm -hmm. And so they are looking for, and they're using their 529 plan. So I do think you have to look at financial aid and 529 plans together and say, what are they incenting that's important? Yeah. They're incenting you to save money for a 529 plan. And people who we know who put in a very small amount of money in, into a 529 plan are much more likely to go to college. Mm -hmm. So I think it, because it sets in place a way of thinking that you're going to college. There is no doubt, I mean, the num I am not going to quibble with your numbers about who is using the 529 plan, but I think you need to think of it in context of how a state spends their money yeah. on, right. on so aid. Given, given that we're stuck with them, <laughs> I think, um, then we should be using them to funnel yeah. funds to those at the bottom rather than giving a tax break to those at the top. I'm not against the idea of college saving, of course. Um, what I'm against is the idea of subsidizing college saving in a way that disproportionately benefits the people at the top. Right. Um, I just want to make a comment on this incentive Please point, do. though, which has yes. come down. Because I think it's, uh, and I think this point about targets and targeting the gap is hugely important. If you set the wrong targets, like increased graduation rates or completion rates, then obviously you you create perverse incentives mm -hmm. <laughs> to just get the kids, a few, a few more of the richer kids to do it. So I think targeting the gap is exactly right, and I'm ex excited by that. But the faculty point about incentives, even if we can't create positive incentives for them, maybe we could get rid of the perverse incentives. Okay. And there are per perverse incentives throughout the system. There are perverse incentives in the way we rank institutions actually, in some of the ranking systems that are used. Actually, if we are incentivizing some of our faculty around certain kinds of outcomes, they're actually incentivized against equity in some cases because it will take more investment on their part to help a kid from a poorer background to achieve that level. And so if you just have crude, if, you, if your outcome measures are too crude, I'm, not, I'm sure no one on this panel does this, but I know institutions that have quite crude outcome measures for their faculty, which create a perverse incentive. And so at the very least, we shouldn't ask faculty to act against their own interests in mm -hmm. promoting equity. And some of our quite crude measurement systems have that effect. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we only have a few minutes left. Um, I want to uh, just come back to this issue of collective action. Uh, Helen, um, you know, he, you know he, Richard talked about how he approaches his own personal contributions. Why is it so hard to get Americans to think collectively about the collective good? Why, when did it happen that we sort of became so focused on just ourselves? I mean, I talked in my speech about how there have been times when the American dream was troubled and collective action restored it and strengthened it. And I guess people at those times thought that was the right thing to do. I'm sure not everybody was in favor of the New Deal. I know that is the case. Uh, but, but enough were. You know, what, what is it, when you think about in the Texas legislature trying to hammer out an understanding about the fact that we're all in this together in Texas and that the changing demography of our state is really a preview of the country to come. What do you do? How do you, how do you make those arguments? Well, you just made uh, my speech uh, that I make on the Appropriations Subcommittee on Education that it really isn't about those people. It's about all of us. Mm -hmm. uh, because if we do not do what is necessary 
uh, to make sure that people improve overall the level of education in the state of Texas, then in fact, we will no longer be competitive right. domestically right. and globally. That's so right. at the end of the day, it, it's not about those people, it's about all of us. Yeah, right. And I think when people start to understand that message, they're willing to make a higher investment in yeah. education. One of the things that has troubled me a great deal in Texas is that in 2003, we deregulated tuition. And so when we deregulated tuition, tuition went up mm -hmm. and our contributions went down. Yeah. And uh, I, I just don't think mm -hmm. uh, that that is the right way to go. And I certainly encourage our colleges and universities to, to, to uh, be more diverse in their approach. And as long as we are being provocative, uh, I challenged our two flagship universities, explain to me how you can get all these athletes who look like mm -hmm. you, and you cannot <laughs> improve your enrollment mm -hmm. percentages. Uh, it, it, it just is, uh, it, it just escapes me. Actually, Helen, when you think about some of the structural changes we're calling for, pathways, uh, uh, you know, more uh, informed choice and, and supports, athletes, <laughs> honor students, uh, those folks have been receiving that stuff for a long time. Why not everybody else? I only have time for a couple more points, and Ben, I want to go to you first, and then we'll uh, give um, Scott the last word here. Uh, ben, you know, uh, when I think about a state that under, once understood that we're really all in this together. I mean, California was the model, right? Uh, the public investments that occurred in California to make uh, higher education accessible to everyone in that state was the envy of the nation, and not the case anymore. Not so much anymore. So tell me, you know, are, is California going to find its way back, or are we just, are those days just gone forever? No, I think, I think, I'm, I'm hoping. I don't know that I think, but I'm hoping that California will, in fact, head back. And I think that the, uh, the, the contributions that I was talking about earlier right. are a, a step in the right direction. You have to remember, or if you don't know, we come from a part of the state that has been termed Appalachia West, the Valley of the Poor. It is, we're ground zero for, for the Grapes of Wrath, right? So when you're reading the Grapes of Wrath, you're reading about our towns, Bakersfield, yes. Fresno, yes. Merced. Yes. We are, we are that. We, and, and so when, when you think about our part of the region, uh, and I look back at teachers, when, when you were asking about when did the country change, I was the beneficiary of teachers who had been World War II vets. Yeah. All white. Mm -hmm. I, never, I never had a teacher of color until I got yeah. into college, frankly. Yeah. Interestingly enough, they never, that group of people were, in fact, the, the greatest generation because they never saw color. I mean, they were teaching in schools where we're like 70 or 80 percent of us were, were Mexican kids from farm worker communities. And I remember someone asking a visitor coming in run time to do a review and then asking the English teacher, she said, did you know that all of your kids are, are Mexican? And God bless her, she goes, you know, I, and, I, and I believed her, and she said, I never noticed. Mm. Because those teachers and those people were so committed mm. to what it was that they were supposed to do mm. that that was part of that time when mm. the country was investing yeah. and, and were, was doing things for the right reasons. Yeah. I think as we've changed over the years in California, at the very least, uh, you know, we've, we've gone, we've waved back and forth, but we're, we're, we're such a blue state now yeah. Yeah. That, uh, that oftentimes... A lot, of the, um, a lot of the priorities from, from some of our folks maybe haven't been directed to education yeah. as, as best as they should have been. Yeah. So we do have some leadership now. I think, I think at the CSU system, certainly, and at the community college system, we have a new chancellor who has really taken, uh, taken right. us in a different direction. Yeah. So I do think that we're turning the Good. corner, and I think we're going to get back. Good. Good. Ultimately, ultimately, we can get it to the point where okay. young people are getting to college the tuition, that the, you don't have those kinds of barriers, yeah, yeah. right? So that ultimately, see, yeah. because our big issue too is once we get them in there, access hasn't been 
yeah. as great a problem for us in the Central Valley yeah. Yeah. as it used to be. Yeah. It's keeping them. Yeah. Amen. It's yeah. those gateway yeah. courses. Yeah. Yeah. Right. It's getting them through those gateway yeah. courses where they're banging right. their You're head. You're in the right banging place, Ben. You're in the right place. Head. Stick with CCA. We'll get you there. And, 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 so, and so that's that's the issue for us. Yeah. That's where we're going. Yeah. We're trying to get them through there, yeah. trying to get them in and out quickly. Yeah. Scott's got a great American dream story to finish, but Teresa, you asked for a little just, bit of time. I just wanted to say, you asked the question about how, how do we have a collective will to do this? And if you look across the history of our nation, it's been in times of crisis that we come yes. together. And yes. I think that the call for us is to, that we have to acknowledge and advocate that this yes. is a time of crisis. Yes. And I think when we do that, and we do that through a lens of improving lives for all people, yes. then I think we have an opportunity. So yes. it's, it's really getting that message that there is yes. a crisis here that Good. will allow us to come together, I think. Absolutely. Scott, you have an American Dream Project that your students do. Tell us about that briefly. Okay. Um, our students all come to a bridge program for a couple weeks before school starts. And their assignment, this time it was to read a comic book, The Absolutely True Diary of a Part-Time Indian, and then to look at the persona of the character in that, either from the reservation perspective or the small town perspective, mm. and then in a group go into one of New York's neighborhoods and look at the demographic and economic data and analyze how that student would live out the American dream in that neighborhood. Wow. And I think it's a very challenging assignment, but I get to go to the presentations, and I think you'd be blown away with the quality of the work and the critical thinking that their students mm. are able to do based upon a very tough mm. assignment. And I think way too often we sell our students short. Our mm. students are largely immigrants, half don't speak English at home. They and their families know the intrinsic value of education, and they rise to the occasion. Amen. Well, on that note, let's thank our panel.